Hey, welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. Jake is on the other side of the continent right now, so he will not be joining us. <laughs> Out on assignment. Yes, yes. He's also seeing Slayer. Bastard. I know. I mean, I, know. I saw him with him. Yeah, so he basically bookends the tour. Mm. Lucky fella. Yep. Um, but, you know, in his stead, we have Eric Shanor who is here to talk about the uh, brand new edition of Age of Bronze, his historical epic retailing the Trojan War in graphic novel format. Um, that's out in comic book stores everywhere on September 12th. But let's let Eric talk about it. And joining us this week, Eric Shanower, the, uh, the writer and artist of Age of Bronze, getting an all-new, all-color, you know, full-color edition for the very first time through Image Comics. Out of comic book shops everywhere on Wednesday, September 12th. Eric, thanks thanks again for coming on the show. My pleasure, Sam. Thanks for having me. So let's get the kind of the big question out of the way first. With you know, with Age of Bronze, you had originally done this in, in black and white, and that's how it was originally rendered across this entire these volumes showcasing the uh, the Trojan War and the fall of Troy. How was it kind of was it always kind of in the back of your mind like, man, maybe someday we can do this in full color, and was it was it kind of a hard process to translate it from black and white into a full color book? Well, I don't really remember if I had planned for color at the beginning. I mean, uh, at the beginning, when it first began publication, I you know color costs more to print, so uh, I didn't know whether the the series would would take off at all. Um, so I just opted for black and white. I also really didn't have the time to color it myself, and I, I would have wanted to color it myself at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason we went to color was I was approached by a, a digital publisher about seven years ago, and they wanted to do Age of Bronze as an app for iPad, which I thought was a fine idea, and I'm the one, they wanted to add a lot of bells and whistles. And I said, well, you know, it doesn't cost any more to publish it in color digitally than it does in black and white. So um, it just seemed to me that going color for the digital digital edition was, was, was sort of a no-brainer. But I still didn't have the time to, to, to do the coloring myself. Uh, so I, the uh, digital publisher and I uh, agreed that they would find a, a colorist and I would have, uh, you know, final say on every page, on every colored page. Um, that was really important to me because I want to make sure that the comic looks correct to me, uh, that it falls within my, the, my vision for what this whole entire project is. So they found me a, a colorist, John Dallaire, and he began work and, uh, uh, at the beginning, it was a little rough because we didn't have a real, real working relationship, and and we live on opposite sides of the country from each other. So we were working by email, and uh, uh, I don't know, we were using file transfer protocols, and the colors would change, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was it was kind of a nightmare, and I didn't think it was going to work. But but finally, we got everything smoothed out, and and uh, it's been several years now, so we're working together really easily. It, we've got our routine down. Um, his name is John Dallaire, and he sends me page, colored pages. I send him black and white pages. He sends me colored pages back. I send him tons and tons of notes. He sends me a colored page back, and I send him more notes. We go through that average of four times per page until I finally approve it. Um, and I'm really happy with the end result, the way the, way, uh, the, the coloring looks now. And I hope everybody else will be too. Oh, I mean, it really, it, it really does pop. And uh, I have to ask, how was it? Because in in the first volume, you've kind of got a sequence that's very. Um, they're recounting a story. the The Trojans are recounting a story fairly early on in that first volume, and you change your your art style, where it kind of, um, it almost has like a almost like a Popeye quality to it, right? Because it's very like. It's very realistic yeah. for most most of the story, and then you've kind of got this anecdotal story in the middle of it, and you just com- you know subtly change the style. There was that kind of fun to kind of to change things up. Oh, was that was that subtle? It wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really fun. Uh, whenever I do some sort of flashback, I always uh, take on some different style to try to characterize uh, either what the flashback is or the person who's telling it. Um, so that particular one was being told by the king Priam, the king of Troy, about uh, an incident that happened when he was uh, a little kid. So uh, I, the my intention was to make all the characters in that much more caricatured, uh, to set it off as uh, more of a story than history, and to uh, try to imply that maybe what we're hearing Prime tell tell us isn't necessarily the truth and maybe exaggerated and uh, you know some details may be left out hmm. you know speaking of stories that's what that, yeah that's well no what yeah that, that's what that that's what that change in style was supposed to indicate right almost like kind of these caricatures of the characters and, and everything um but you know speaking of story what do you think it is about you know you've got paris you've got You've got Odysseus, you've got Hector, who, it's kind of interesting, because you don't, when you think of, like, the Iliad, I feel like it's almost almost always told from the, the Greek perspective, and yet the Greeks d- themselves don't really show until near, really the final act of this first volume. Um, with, uh, what do you think it is about, like, you know, Homer's stories, or really just the Greek Greek history in general that has endured literally for millennia at this point? Well... <laughs> Story, Homer's Iliad, uh, you know, it's just a powerful story that really speaks to the basic instincts of human nature. I just, I have to assume that that's why it's lasted so long, um, that every every generation rediscovers it. And, uh, you know, it's, connect, it's a power, powerful, powerful story of, you know, Achilles, who feels betrayed, and he has to sort of step outside his his um, the way he was brought up to uh, to say, no, we don't have to live like this. We can we, we need to live with honor, with nobility. Um, I think that resonates with a lot of people, even if they even if that's not the quite, quite the message that people get, even if they just think it's a great adventure story. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of people who don't like the Iliad because, you know, it is really repetitious with all these battles, battle after battle after battle. And we hear how all the people die in excruciating detail, which what part of their body the sword or spear went into and what what body part, you know, popped out the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just goes on and on for pages and pages. I find that most people like the Odyssey much better, which is the sequel to the Iliad. It's more of a fantasy adventure story. But uh, the story of the Trojan War is much more than just the Iliad. I think it's really fascinating how every every age, every generation, every civilization has taken that basic story and added to it or retold it in in an, in a way that makes sense to to that people or, or to that culture. Um, so that's part of the fascination for me, taking all the different versions of the story that have that have uh, accumulated from Homer's Iliad, which is the earliest, on on down to basically the present, and try to you know synthesize them all into one long story to deal with all the contradictions, because there are many contradictions to uh, to make the characters. Um, can they keep their personalities consistent? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's surprising to me the way that um, most of the main characters have stayed consistent through the millennia. Uh, a version versions that are hundreds of years apart, you'll still have the characters re- as recognize, recognizable, acting in recognizable ways. I mean, it's not totally consistent, but it's surprising at how consistent that is. Um, even when the concerns of whoever's telling the story are obviously obviously from their own culture and and like 
Homer's culture from whoever Homer was, but uh, the culture from Greece in the in the eighth century BC would not recognize the concerns of a much later telling of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a challenge for me too, to try to figure out, okay, why was this story told at this particular time by these particular people? Um, and, but I'm, I'm setting the story in the correct period, which is the 13th century BC. So I've got to sort of strip it of any more modern concerns. And when I mean, when I say modern, no, I don't mean necessarily today. I just mean more after the late Bronze Age, 13th century. You had mentioned alternate versions and that sort of thing. And I just, this is going to yeah. kind of sound as like a bit of a left field question. Um, but what did you think of the Brad Pitt, Eric Bana, Troy from like 2004? Oh. That, that bad? <laughs> well, um... Oh, God. You know, I don't think there's ever been a good movie about the Trojan War. Well, well, I can't say that's totally true. There was a, a Michael Katrianis, uh film of the Trojan Women with Catherine Hepburn and Vanessa Redgrave from the early 70s, which I think is a good movie. Mm -hmm. But I can't think of any other movie about the Trojan War that I think is really very good. Um, I didn't think that movie was very good. Uh you know, there, what, there, there are parts that are fine, aspects that are fine. Um, the story itself just doesn't lend itself to uh, a two-hour, two to three-hour telling. How you can, I guess, I, I, I could see like like the Trojan women. That's just a one small episode in this whole tapestry of the Trojan War. But if you try to tell the whole tapestry, at least a significant part of it, it's just going to be a terrible movie because you just can't deal with it. Um, I think a, a TV series would be much more would be much more successful. Um, I guess there was a recent BBC series about the Trojan War. I didn't see any of it, but a lot of people have been asking what I thought of it. Um, so, but I don't know because I haven't seen it. Um, there was a, there was another TV TV version I don't know about 20 years ago uh, that sort of did some weird changes to the end of the story. Um, brought a lot of the characters who had remained in Greece over to Troy to deal with them. Um, I didn't think it was particularly good. But my version is the only good one. <laughs> it's certainly like uh, you know, it, it's it's fascinating because you had mentioned like you know people tend to favor the Odyssey in terms of the two big Homeric poems because of its fantasy elements. You know, you're you know for our re listeners, I was going to say readers, but you know maybe they can they can read our like annotate our our um, podcast anyway. The um, <laughs> For our listeners at home, you you had done the Oz books with Scotty Young. You've done the the Nemo, the Adventures of Nemo in Slumberland. So you're no stranger to the fantasy, but you right. very consciously like kind of stay away from the fantasy elements with Age of Bronze. Was that a very much like let's just do this kind of like as as just retelling the history as the history of it, like keeping the the eye on the humanity of it all? Well, I want. Uh, remo removing the supernatural elements was one of my main uh, one of the main things that propelled me to to take on this project. I wanted to tell the story uh, without the gods coming down in the flesh and directing things, because one of the main points that I think of it, one of the main points of the story that I want to get across is, you know, these people they're they're doing terrible things to each other. Uh, and they're always, but they always say, oh, it was the gods that told us to do it. So they're trying to get out of the, their own personal responsibility. I think that's a pretty universal statement. It doesn't just happen to the people in, of the Trojan War. I wanted to uh, tell this story again so, and bring out that aspect that, you know, we are personally responsible here in our civilization, in our society or what we do, and anyone who tries to put that responsibility on somebody else, whether it's a god or just another person, is, is sort of a, I don't think that's the right way to live. Right. It kind of, you're like you were saying, it kind of takes the accountability, you know, out of, out of, yeah. out of it all. 
yeah, accountability is a good word. We are accountable for our own actions, for our own decisions. Um, I, that's what, that's a big part of what this story means to me. And that's a big part of what I'm trying to do in retelling it to say, look, uh, people do horrible things to each other. Um, we've got to deal with that, but those people need to be held accountable and we ourselves need to be held accountable for our own decisions. So be careful in making your decisions. And remember, there's not some voice up in the sky telling you what to do. You got to, you have to make that decision yourself. You're responsible. Well, in, in keeping an eye on the, on the human elements, would you say Achilles and Paris are very much like kind of opposite numbers? You've got the, the more noble Achilles, the, you know, almost this kind of Greek Bushido um, warrior, you know, code. And then you've got the, you've got Paris on the other end, who's kind of, you know, he's always kind of a, a bit more of a trickster and certainly a, a lot more impulsive and, and impetuous. Well, he's just a jerk. Um, <laughs> and, and that's part of his charm, that he's a jerk. Uh, I I, you know, I'm not... It's not my intention to go two separate sides, one with Achilles, one with, with uh, Paris. Uh, you know, I don't... I have, I have conflicting... I mean, I love all the characters. At, at, at the foundation, I love all the characters. I couldn't really be telling the story if I didn't love them in some way. But, you know, I have to uh, acknowledge their flaws, and pretty much all of them are flawed. Even Achilles, Achilles is flawed. He, he, he has this uh, blindness. He can't see past his own need for to be noble, to be great, to be uh, someone who's going to be honored in song for the rest of uh, rest of Western civilization. And I, I mean, you know that happens, but because the Iliad has lasted, but um, he, he needs that. Um, and that sort of, that sort of blinds him. Um, actually, the, the episode I'm working on right now, which is the uh, meeting of Achilles and Helen on the top of Mount Ida, um, deals with this. He, Achilles at that moment has the ability to completely stop the war, or at least he thinks he does, but he chooses not to because if he does stop the war, that means he won't gain glory. So you can say, you can argue whether that's a good decision or not. I mean, certainly if he had stopped the war, we wouldn't have had the story, <laughs> but uh, we'll, a lot of people are going to suffer because of that decision. So, yeah. There's that, yeah. his, it's almost like this, it's this vainglorious nobility. It's nobility in the sense that he, he holds himself to a higher standard, but he's aware of his, he's also in love with his own legend before his own legend had even been told. He's like the, yeah. the idea yeah. that he knows, and it's, it, it's, it costs him every, you know, at the end of the day, you know, spoilers for a thousands and thousands of year old story. It costs him his life. Right. Yeah. Yes, it does. But don't tell anybody yet. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, again, with this, with this first volume, you, you really do focus on the Trojans for most of it. Is it because a good chunk of, um, a good chunk of the, um, of the story, once the war goes underway, the Trojans are, are largely holed up in their city, and so you kind of wanted to humanize them before you stuck them behind the walls? I, the first volume focuses on the Trojans simply because that seemed to be where the best place for the story to start with Paris um, on Mount Ida before he knows the big secret of his past, and then when he goes to Troy um, exploring the, the society of the Trojans. That's just where the story seemed to start to me. Um, I guess I could have started it elsewhere. I guess I could have started it uh, in Sparta with Menelaus and Helen and had, you know, Paris suddenly arrive. But then we'd have to tell this whole huge backstory about how he got to the point he's gotten to. And that doesn't seem very, like a very good way to tell it to me. I just, that just seemed the best place to start. And it starts there. And there's no real star of this there's no real main character it's sort of an ensemble version 
uh, I remember I remember when it when Age of Bronze began, people were a little confused or concerned that I was seemed to be following Paris and that they thought I was just going to start following him the whole way. But uh, I think by now it's pretty clear that it's more of an ensemble thing and we follow whatever characters are important to follow at, at any given point of the story. I don't know. I hope that's clear. <laughs> yeah, no, no, th- th- absolutely. You know, and of course, you know, there's more volumes to come, but Okay, yeah. we we've kind of focused on the on the male protagonists of the of this ensemble cast. To you, who is Helen of Troy? Who is this face that launched a thousand ships? Well, Helen. I mean, she's this you know little rich bitch. Um, <laughs> she uh, she's been raised as a princess. I mean. And she is a princess in, in all uh, uh, meanings of that word. Uh, so she thinks she, she can do what she wants. She thinks she can get what she wants. But uh, this story is basically her wake, her wake, long, long wake-up call for her to sort of figure out that life isn't necessarily so easy that other people do matter, that other people have feelings, that uh, she can't just take what she wants at the moment she wants it and discard it when she's tired of it. Uh, She gets herself into this situation because she thinks Paris is kind of sexy. And uh, she finds out that after, you know, the sex appeal wears off that she's really not very happy. And, uh, but meanwhile, this, you know, nations have suddenly come, have clashed over this decision she made. So she's got a, you know, a way to get out of it and it's not easy. Right. It's kind of, yeah. So Helen, the story of Helen in the Trojan War is, is sort of waking up to the wider world around her and figuring out how to deal with people as, as real humans on their own level. Hmm. Yeah. So she, you know, it's a character that initially, like you were saying, kind of with her kind of sheltered, pampered lifestyle, doesn't understand the, the nature of consequence until a, t- a decade long war span between two nations kind of <laughs> proves as the ultimate consequence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like you were saying, I'm trying to think who who is the least flawed of all these characters. And yeah, that is probably the most prescient thing about uh, the the biggest appeal of like all of these ancient Greek stories. You see, certainly see it in you know Sophocles, like with the the um, the uh, the Oedipus trilogy. You definitely see it, you know, certainly in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, Odysseus is a bit of a cad on on the way back to Ithaca. Um, would you say, I mean, we've mentioned that Achilles has a flawed nobility, but if there is any, who is the least flawed among them? Is it Hector? Yeah, I would say Hector. He, he is really just trying to do the best job he can in whatever situation he finds himself. He's pretty clear-eyed. Um, but even then, you know, that's sort of his flaw. He, he feels responsible, and that's going to be his downfall. He can't back down from Achilles, even though everyone's telling him. his wife is begging him, you know, don't go out there, don't. I know you're gonna you're gonna die. I'm just stay with me. And he's like, I'm sorry, I can't. I have responsibility to this to all the people of this city. And is that is that a flaw or is that something noble? Is that something to be admired? Well, you know, it's in Hector, it's both. So, I mean, and that's one of the great things about, about this story, that these characters are so, so multifaceted. They're really fascinating. Um, I love working with, with them. But as far as, you know, the most noble character of them all, I would, yeah, it's Hector. Right. The idea, I mean, I suppose the uh, term hubris has to come from somewhere in, <laughs> in some regard, right? Yeah. And I, I think that's what, you know, 
if there's anything to take away for I don't know why I keep referencing this movie, but it's probably because it's the last adaptation in pop mainstream popular culture. But that's one thing I did enjoy about the 2004 Troy, other than like Brad Pitt's like super jacked physique. Because I remember seeing that, I was like, "Damn, this he got yoked for this one." But the um, <laughs> when when um, like Eric Bana is probably the best performer in that ensemble cast as the as the the reluctant but steadfast, responsible Hector. Yeah. Yeah, I only saw it once in the theater, so I don't remember it that well. And what I remember mostly is the opinion that I formed at the time I saw it. And, uh, yeah, I can easily understand that Eric Bana would be a better actor than Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> the, uh, although Brad Pitt isn't, isn't horrible or anything. No, um, no. Uh, there was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but at, early in the movie, there's some sort of reference the time period and I can't remember exactly what it is and I haven't gone back to look but I feel as though anybody can take the Trojan War and tell the story in any way they want and that's valid but if you're going to set it in a certain time period then you are sort of setting it as history not as fantasy um, either telling I think is valid mm. but make a choice and I think they did not bear through as making it a history, uh, particularly in some of the design sets and costume designs. I mean, they just said, okay, this is, this is a great story, right? Well, we're going to take, uh, take costumes and weaponry and all kinds of things from whatever. As long as it seems like ancient Greece, no one's going to know. We'll just throw it all in there. Uh, and so that, I found that aspect really, really disappointing. And so it's certainly not what I'm trying to do with my version. Sure. Now, um, you had mentioned that you currently with this uh, new uh, these new volumes, you're in the process of the sequence between Achilles and uh, Helen on Mount Ida. Do you, obviously the, uh, the first volume comes out on... Um, on September twelfth, do you have a tentative yeah. timeline for the for the remaining? Um, is it three? No, was it it's a thousand ships? It's betrayal. Um, so it's volume one is a thousand ships. Volume two is sacrifice. That will be out next year. Um, the next volume would be betrayal part one. That will be out the following year, twenty twenty, and the fourth will be out twenty twenty. Betrayal part two in twenty twenty one. Um, I'm gonna. I'm doing. Single issues still, but they're only going to be in, in digital form from now on. We're not doing any more print single issues. And they will all be in color. Uh, issue 34 will be out in early 2019. And I'll be doing, my, t my plan at the moment is to do two issues a year uh, so that by the time we get to all the, all the current volumes, our reissued in color will be in, will be just ready for the next volume of new material, right. all in color, and, just, and we'll just keep going from there. Sounds good, awesome. Now, uh, Eric, something we ask everybody that comes on our our fine program: What are you currently geeking out over? <laughs> what am I geeking out over? Oh, okay. Well, this is totally different. Um, my partner, David Maxine, is planning a book on the 1903 Broadway Wizard of Oz. It was a huge, huge Broadway hit in the early 20th century. Um, so I'm helping him with research. So I've been doing all these, this ton of research for several years now on this show. Uh, uh, a complete script from this so does not exist, so we've had to reconstruct a lot of it. Um, it's never going to be fully reconstructed just because so much, so much of it has disappeared. I've also been contacting descendants of the original cast. Uh, it ran for seven years and um, several times on Broadway, and then there were two touring companies for a while, and then uh, after 
the main seven year run, it went into stock and there were a bunch of regional theaters did it through the teens. Uh, so I have about 500 and I think 528 names of cast members who were in the show. I mean, of course, after, with that long a run, the cast kept changing. People keep coming in and out, in and out, just like it is on Broadway today. Sure. And uh, so I've been looking for descendants of the, of the cast members just to see if we can scare up any, you know, stray material that would help in reconstructing this show. Um, so I've been in contact with maybe a dozen at this point, Keep running across more, but it takes uh, genealogical research too. So, uh, and none of them, unfortunately, has come up with any major, major uh, material. I mean, there has been some some stuff that that they still have from their from several generations ago, from their great grandparents or their great grand cousins or whatever whatever relationship they happen to be um but that's what i'm geeking out over and every time i find some new tidbit of information i'm always like david david come look at this <laughs> just but yes yeah, or, or listen, to, listen to this just to see how far the uh the uh frank l Baum uh rabbit hole goes yeah well he was he was the one he wrote the script for this and he wrote a lot of the lyrics for the for the initial uh, version of the show which started in Chicago in 1902 and I mean there was some <laughs> if, if you think of L. Frank Baum as this nice jolly guy who writes you know fantasy adventure for children well you know he was human too and could, could really you know get into conflicts with people damn um, I do have to, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't get you on and, and didn't ask this question. We've discussed the appeal of the Trojan War, that it, why, how it's endured for, for millennia. For you, what has the appeal been for The Wizard of Oz and all its subsequent, you know, adaptations and other, other novels in the, in the series, other books in the series? Oh, I don't know. I just like it. <laughs> um, I was... I saw the I saw the Judy Garland movie on TV when I was a kid, and then I got the an ab, abridgment of the book of the Wizard of Oz out from the library, and I was I was like, oh, I like this. And then I was in a bookstore. I was six years old. My parents said, pick out a book, and I saw there were like several Oz books. And I was like, wow, there are more Oz stories. And so I chose one, and they read it to me a chapter a night, and uh, that I was just hooked. In the beginning of that book, there was a list on, a, on an early page that had a list of the 40 books in the series. And I'm like, I want all of them. <laughs> so I spent a lot of my life getting all of them. And I'm still sort of trapped in that Oz world. I, and it's endless. I mean, Oz just penetrates into every aspect of, of U.S. culture in ways that most people don't know or don't think of or really wouldn't care and it really doesn't matter, but it does go everywhere. So there, it, the pursuit of new odd stuff is always endless. Yeah, I, I feel like most people, you know, only know about the 1939 film or I guess maybe the James Franco film or Return to Oz if we're getting really obscure. But people, yeah, don't in, f- mostly know that... that that bomb turned out like dozens of these things over the course of his lifetime. Like the, how, how deep that, like he wrote more Oz than Lewis Carroll wrote, you know, Wonderland stories. It's, it's kind of remarkable <laughs> how immersive and how expansive that world is. Yes. And other, the, after he died, the publisher hired other writers who, who wrote more than he did. Yeah. And uh, there, there, there are many, many movies. And I mean, wicked on, Right now is this whole massive thing. What it's the, one of the longest running shows on Broadway, and there's a movie coming out in a year or two. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm totally excited about the, the Broadway show from 1903, and I don't know. It it, it touches so much. Um, I, I it. One of the cast members in it was uh, the best friend of Evelyn Nesbitt, um, whose 
husband Harry K. Thaw murdered Stanford White, which was the murder of the century for the first decade. I sort of always uh, think of these two bookend scandals of the 20th century, um, the Stanford White murder and O.J. Simpson. They always seem really similar to me. I also think, you know, the O.J. Simpson trial, if, if, that, if we were back in ancient Greece and all that stuff had happened, um, O.J. Simpson would, would develop into a Greek myth because that's the kind of story that I think at least the, Tro that the Trojan War and most of the Greek myths is sort of developed from. Any of them that has a historic, historical kernel, uh, probably there was somebody, there was some conflict at, in Troy in the site where that site is, and it just sort of developed into this, this major story cycle. Um, and I think, you know, in a couple hundred years, are people going to be telling the same kind of thing about, say, O.J. Simpson? It's just that sort of uh, fascinating thing that captures, that captures the society. I certainly remember where I was when I saw on, like, Fox 5 where that, where that white Ford Bronco was on the 405. Like there's just something, uh -huh. oh, just something enduring about that. All these, honest God, decades later now, <laughs> you know. Um, yes, decades. Yeah. Well, like the JF, JFK's death, you know, all the conspiracy theories that are still alive and and thriving, and it's you know, it's a whole, this whole mythology that's been built up around this one event. Um, I, that's that's kind of it's just it's. I think the Trojan War is sort of the same thing. Well, yeah, it's it's finding that that human, and you could say that about I guess, I guess you can say that to a degree about the Wizard of Oz as well. But there's always like, despite whatever the trappings are, be it a white Ford Bronco or gloves that don't fit, be it be it you know a face that can launch a thousand ships, be it a pumpkin headed man, there's oh there's a human element somewhere in there that keeps readers or, or, you know, that keeps people coming back for more. Yeah. So on the, on that kind of grandstanding note, on <laughs> is there uh, any, anything else that are you, you... Trying sum, are you trying to sum up, Sam? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, this is, uh, it's kind of how I, kind of how I do <laughs> try to tie it all. But, um, but Eric, is there anything that you'd else that you'd like to plug before we return you to the wilds of the West coast? Yes. Yes. Um, I have also been working on Casper and the three stooges. I've been drawing them for a small publisher called American mythology. Um, some of my Casper, uh, stuff has come out, but I think the three stooges book is still forthcoming. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't look at previews that closely. So, uh, I don't know when this stuff comes out. I just draw it and turn it in. I have to ask contractually because the three stooges loom heavily in my early childhood. My father was a huge Shemp Howard fan of all the stooges. He was a Shemp Howard fan. And, um, <laughs> there's no Shemp in this version. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There, is there Joe Besser? Did you did you put in Joe Besser instead? <laughs> it's um, Larry Moen Curley. The stories are set in the in the mid nineteen thirties. They're supposed to look like a Stooges short. They're being uh, printed in in black and white with tones um, to look like you know an old short. And I've had to uh, you know go back and do research for the backgrounds and things. So. That, or 1930, you know, 1930 cars and things like that. Sure, that Eric. That means you can do the crossover that we've always wanted. The classic Stooges meet, like the the Curly Shemp Joe Curly Joe team up that we never got. Well, I'm not writing them, so if if, if the editor wants to commission that, fine. I'll draw, I'll draw whatever the script says. <laughs> I just I had to I had to try I had to try but yeah so again <laughs> Age of Bronze brand new all color and for the first time edition out on September twelfth keep an eye out for future colored editions keep an eye out for Casper the friendly ghost of course read the uh, 
the uh, the uh, Wizard of Oz books with Scotty Young out by Marvel. Read um, the uh, Nemo Adventures in Slubberland books through uh, IDW. Eric, thanks again for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure. Pleasant chat. Pleasant chat. I didn't think I would get to talk about the Wizard of Oz, the Three Stooges, and the Trojan War all in one interview. Yeah, you know, I actually learned that there was like over a dozen Wizard of Oz There's like stories. There's 40 Wizard of Oz Jesus, stories. that's like four dozen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I knew I knew about Wizard of Oz and I assumed that Return to Oz was also based on the same, you know, source material, mm-hmm. but I had no idea that there was more. Oh yeah. Hell yes. Hell yes. Did you know that there was four volumes of the Trojan War? I also did not know that. Yes. I think I knew about two. Well, I mean, just Eric's work spans yeah. over four volumes. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, be interesting to see if he tackles the Odyssey, but considering he's leaving the supernatural elements out, it would be like a, it would be like a survivalist story yeah. as opposed to like a, there's Cyclops. Yeah. It would be like, oh, brother, where art thou? Yes. Yes. Which is, as you uh, are waking uh, at me, uh, <laughs> an adaptation and a modernization of that story. Yeah. With a lot more blues. Yeah. Or blue it's, like, dress. it's like Romeo plus Juliet. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, Paul Rudd as Paris. Yeah. That's all that's that's I get, that's all I got. Leonardo DiCaprio's He's one. there. <laughs> yeah. Kate Kate um what the hell's her name? She's in Homeland and Claire Danes. Yeah. Claire Danes, that's it. Uh but yeah, you getting anything, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> uh I uh, I subjected a couple of my friends to Zardoz. Mm. The gun is good. The penis is evil. Exactly. Zardoz. <laughs> uh, I didn't just shout. That's a line. Yeah, it is. It I, is. I know I'm prone to shout things like that, but that's actually a quote <laughs> yeah. from the film. Can confirm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. The, a bunch of my friends had seen the picture of Sean Connery in a red speedo floating S- around. Speaking of the Wizard of Oz, Zardoz. Spoilers. <laughs> yes, for a for a forty some year old film. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh yeah, it's it's a thinly veiled uh, I guess allegory to the Wizard of Oz. Um Kinda. Zardoz himself is based on the Wizard of Oz. Um because yeah, Arthur Frayne is the man behind the cur- curtain. Yes. Uh you n- seem to know more about it than I do, and I've seen the movie three times. Uh you get to see Sean Connery in a wedding dress. I don't it's know true. why more people don't know about yeah. it. But yeah, so a, a, a handful of my friends had uh, seen the the picture of uh, Sean Connery running around in a red Speedo floating around the internet. And I was like, oh yeah, Zardoz. And they were like, huh? And I was like, yeah, it's this weird ass movie that he made post-Bond, sort of. It was like the second thing he did after Bond. Yeah. Uh, and um, and uh, I was like, yeah, I own it. I have it on Laserdisc. You want to watch it? And they were like, hell yeah. Let's see what this is, and I was like, "Do not expect <laughs> to enjoy the movie." Uh, so we, you know, we made a we made a fun drinking game out of it. You know, whenever uh, I had actually found a couple like drinking game rules online, but it was like whenever someone says Zardoz, uh, whenever you hear chimes, which is a lot, yep. uh, and whenever there's a uh, gratuitous uh, shots of nudity, which also there is a lot. Mm, I mean, like, like Sean Connery basically repopulates the earth. Basically, that's the the yeah, that's one of his points of usefulness <laughs> in, in the movie, uh, or at least that's the plan. I don't know if it ever actually comes to fruition. But fucks a lot of women. Yes, <laughs> yes, but th- <laughs> it's not an immediate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't learn a lot in school, but I I learned a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> there's a weight <laughs> yeah. uh but yeah you know the, the, uh he he also ends up killing a lot of people uh very well actually not even very soon one of the things that i it noticed kills arthur frayne like, yeah. from jump but uh one of the things that i learned in this movie or one of the things i noticed this watching i was like how long does everything take because there's there's a bunch of times where it just feels like there's been a time jump mm-hmm. of like oh one month later you know uh, but it doesn't tell you that, and it gives you no indication uh, th- whether it's a month or two minutes uh, in the future. Um, and then, like by the end of it, like it doesn't even care, uh, and and neither do you because you're drunk from you know all the chimes going off. Um, very uh, 
like, and this is a Borman thing. He always kind of has like very almost overexposed shots, like a lot of like light. Yeah. And, not not like lens flary like um like like J J Abrams but yes o- overexposed. I agree. Uh, but like in that same vein of like Logan's Run, also very like pretty present future. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if that's the official name of it, but that's what I call it because it looks very seventies, but also looks very futuristic. Yeah, kind of like eighties future. You know, is a very distinct look. Eighties future is like a cyberpunk. Seventies. Yeah. Is like kind of like uh, it's almost Asimovian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, there, there, there's something about it that I enjoy subjecting people to it. Kind of like how you are with Double Team. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yes. But not like how I am with Wild Wild West, <laughs> because I'm just like I love it, guys. Why don't you? <laughs> uh, and, but it, with like, this, I know full and well Double Team fucking sucks. Yeah. But it entertainingly fucking sucks. Yeah, yeah, which is why I enjoy watching it with you from time <laughs> to time. Um, but uh, but yeah, so yeah, there's just, there's something fun about forcing or not forcing, but you know, subjecting other people to it. Introducing, yeah, uh, because you're like, oh yeah, it's got Sean Connery, and look at what he's wearing, and people are like, I need to understand the context, and I was like, you're not gonna, you don't have to, but <laughs> here it is, yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, I was on a business trip in Albany over the weekend, and one of the things that me and my coworkers did to pass the time was uh, go see a little film called uh, in a, uh, in Mission Impossible Fallout, which I've already seen, but... With me. Yeah, but, and we've talked about it on the podcast. Uh, but I was like, it's so good that I... Or, you know, so enjoyable that I go watch it again, and I was so pooped from work that after after they left France fell asleep and it was wonderful even though this was like an old theater like uh they still had like the the classic rows of of seating uh and and like shitty chairs that i don't fit in no no recliners mm. I'm, I, I'm so so spoiled by, by the luxury of of uh of seats that uh to go back to what we had back at springfield mall before the remodel it's just uh, uh. <laughs> but no, it was good. It was good the the second time around. Uh, I kept popping in and out, and I was like, "Oh, okay, yeah, I remember this scene. It's fun." <laughs> you know, uh, as Jake would call it, a thirteen dollar nap. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, enjoyed myself. How about you, Sam? You uh, you do anything fun? Ah, uh, you know, I saw a movie myself. Oh, yeah, I saw Crazy Rich Asians. I hear. Great things about that movie. Yes, it is, you know, I think first and foremost, I should say, look, it's a romantic comedy. Yeah. If you know the formula, the genre, it's a romantic comedy. Yeah. Checks all those boxes. Ta-da-da-da-da. Cool. Sleepless in Seattle. Is you... there is there birds? Yes. Bringing that back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Oh, uh, thank God. <laughs> There's also Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, what? No, it's actually, you know, I was pleasantly surprised how fucking funny it was. Mm-hmm. Like, there was multiple times where I was laughing out loud in the theater. Nice. So that was uh, the, there's also Mandarin language covers of Yellow by Coldplay and Material oh. Girl by Madonna. Okay. Both. Well done. <laughs> um, no, it was just like, and it just happens to be a movie. Like I, watching this movie, there are so many like little cultural elements where they don't necessarily force it on you or like over exposition it. But as somebody that grew up in an you know in an Asian household, it was like, oh yeah, we did bond over like rolling dumplings, or we do like drift in between like English and the Asian language. You know, in my case, Korean; in their case, Mandarin. Uh, you know, we do, um, we do enjoy like the, you know Asian street food is almost like an art. Um, you know, that's where stuff like egg rolls and all that comes from, and a lot of Korean dishes too. But um, you know, it was just it was a it was. It was such a pleasant. I was. It's the feel good movie of the summer. Oh, you know, um, I had I had a really good time. Uh, what else did I do? I did an open mic. I did a karaoke night. I did. I bought a bed. <laughs> it's it's almost like buying a zoo. It like is. Jake's not there to be like, yeah, I've seen that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, as have we all. But the, <laughs> um, have you seen We Bought a Zoo? I have not. Oh, okay. I'm the one that likes to keep referencing it. I have not seen it. It's a good film. <laughs> That's what I hear. <laughs> the um, no, I got a bed. <laughs> I, I we ordered, bought a bed. Yeah, I 
bought a uh, cast iron bed because yeah. I wanted something with a little more lumbar support. Yeah. That's the kind of support that I get from a cast iron bed, right? I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Hope, hopefully that's what you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, uh, what, what size did you get? It's just a queen. Yeah. It's just a queen. I, that, I love me a good queen. I do. That's, I, that's what I got over there. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about going full, but I'm like, no, I don't need a king, mm. but I deserve a queen. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's I'm actually was actually kind of excited <laughs> ordering <laughs> that. I was like, "Fuck yeah, I get a fucking fucking cast when, iron bed frame." <laughs> when uh when I was living in New York, I was still living like on a twin, just on the floor. Oh god, yeah. Yeah, uh, you might have vague memories of that because you visited me. Yeah, but uh, you know, I I have certainly have memories of sleeping in twin beds. Yeah, uh, especially someone my size sleeping in a twin bed. Uh, and like an inflatable mattress too, like not even really like a bed bed. Uh, when, uh, when I was living in the Harlem apartment and I decided, you know what, I'm going to fucking treat myself. Went down a couple blocks, uh, to a mattress store and bought the queen size bed that I, that I, that I use now. Uh, actually not, I had to replace it recently, but whatever that got a twin, got a queen size bed frame, box spring, everything. And I was just like. Yeah, I'm an adult doing good things. Yeah, <laughs> it, it felt very, uh, I don't want to say empowering because I don't think that's the right word, but, you know, fulfilling. Yeah, it's whenever yeah. I buy, like, car parts because I have yeah. to, you know, my car is well over a decade old now, so I have to tune it up <laughs> regularly. Um, whenever I whenever I buy car parts, I'm always like, this is going to good use. Yeah. <laughs> this is... This is this is why I have a full time job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These brake pads, these will keep me alive. <laughs> you know. Yeah. This is uh the serpentine belt. This is necessary for things that I do. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. No. It's it's the same basic idea, but with uh, hopefully a whole a hell of a lot less assembly required. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah. That that's uh. I got it. The I'm so when I did the open mic, I did five different songs. Ooh. I know. Um, I got to play around with a delay pedal, and the cool thing about a delay pedal, if you program it for 0.8 rhythm, the uh, every song, and you set the pickups on a solid body electric to uh, the second position, mm-hmm. every song sounds like fucking U2. I was like, oh my god, this is how this is how he does it, that crafty motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> um, Figured him out. I did. Got I you did. the edge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still dig the edge, but I was like, oh. This is all you're doing. <laughs> it's that it's that satisfaction when you learn how to play a song, really on any instrument, when you learn how to play a song for the first time, you're just mm-hmm. like, "Oh, that's cool." Like you kind of it gives you a window, I think, into that into that artist's mind for for a second. Yeah. Um, you know, at least whenever I learn a song on like the guitar or the piano or whatever, but yeah. So it was cool. It was good. And then I did two karaoke songs the following following night, so it was a very musical weekend. Um, but yeah. So again, Age of Bronze. Thanks again to Eric Shanor for coming on the recolored edition, or I guess first time colored edition of Age of Bronze out everywhere on Wednesday, September 12th. This has been another installment catching up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric. Bye. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.